I want to invite you to take your Bible, <clears throat> excuse me, turn to Judges chapter 16. <clears throat> Judges chapter 16. We've been in a series of messages entitled, What is Your? And we've talked about what is your serpent out of Genesis chapter 3. What is that thing that is deceiving, that is deceptive, and all those kind of things. This morning we want to talk about what is your Delilah. Now you're saying, Brother Mark, whoa, just stop for a minute there. Judges chapter 16, this is a very familiar story to you. You understand that? This is the story of Samson and Delilah. Samson, one of the judges of the king of, the, of Israel that God put in place to bring them back into a right relationship with Him. Read with me beginning in Judges chapter 16, verse 4. It says, And it came to pass afterward that he, being Samson, loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee, every one of us, eleven hundred pieces of silver. You know the, the account of the story, and we'll look at it just for a moment. The reason I kind of direct your attention to that, this account this morning is I want you to kind of keep a couple of things in your mind or thoughts as we walk through this passage today. The simple question is, what is controlling your life today? What is influencing your life? What is leading you to make decisions in your life? What person or what thing or what desire or what passion is leading you to make the decisions that you're making in your life today? You see, I'm convinced this morning that our lives are being controlled by something or someone. You may look at me, this brother, and say, Brother Mark, I'm my own man. Nothing controls me. Well, let me tell you something. You're lying. <laughs> and the devil has sold you a bill of goods. Because there's something controlling your life today. There's someone controlling your life today. There's some train of thought. There's some passion. There's some thought process out there that is influencing you to make decisions in your life. But what is it? And what should it be? Should be? We notice here in the text, and I'm just going to kind of walk you through a little bit about Samson. Samson's one of the most, this account is one of the most covered in all of Scripture. Um, it's amazing how God put in place this, and the account is, is very detailed about Samson's life. And I think it's there for a reason. He's called by God and he commits himself to God at a very young age. We know that from prior chapters and you can go back and read of the account of how Samson is called. He's granted exceptional opportunities. And he becomes one of the heroes of God, of, of the children of Israel. Yet he accomplishes very little really as a military leader which is something that's intriguing, and I encourage you sometime to go back and read and study his life more in detail. He really never leads the children of Israel into a, a battle against the Philistines, who were those that were oppressing them at the time. It's not one of those types of leaders. So it's, Samson has a very unique niche when it comes to what happens in Scriptures. Most of Samson's victories are personal and private that we look at, how he defeated different people and different groups of people, but never seem as this large military leader leading all the children of Israel to some great freedom. We never really see that. He's born in a very miraculous way to an old and, and barren godly couple. So it's a miracle that, that Samson is even alive at this point in time. In fact, if you read in chapter 14, you'll find out that he was a very self-centered and rebellious child. None of you have ever had any of them, have you? <laughs> that child is born and you say, oh, a blessing from God. And then as he gets older, you say, ooh, wee, here we go. Rebellious little... Yeah. He's here today so I can tell him. I'll, I'll just tell this on him because he's sitting back there and I can do it. Years ago when... Uh, we first came to ministry here. Brother Scott, Ben Scott was the pastor. Brother Scott was probably at that point in time in uh, his late 60s or early 70s. Matthew and Andrew, they were twins. Andrew was probably about, they were probably about two or three years old at that time. And for some reason or another, I had Andrew at the front door with me as people were walking out. Now Andrew's sitting over there so I can tell this. 
He'll, he'll understand this. And I was holding him, uh, which was not normal, but for some reason or another, I, I got a good idea why. I had a hold of him. And Brother Scott come walking out and he looked at me and he said, that boy's got ornery just oozing out of him. I said, yeah, he does. He, he still does. Don't you understand? So it's amazing there again how God can take there again this, this wonderful birth, a miraculous birth, but something happens in Samson's life where he becomes very self-centered and rebellious. He demands things of his, of his parents. Outwardly, he seems to be respectful, but inside he is callous and he is corrupted. We find that out very early in Scripture. His actions, later on in, as he takes, after he takes the vow of the Nazarite that he's committed to, uh, he, he violates those things in many different ways. There again, read those through. But what, in the long term, what happens is Samson becomes to get comfortable with the enemy. Remember the Philistines. He talks with them. He, he plays with them. He gives them riddles and plays games with them. Here the enemy is. Here he is. He's kind of dabbling there with the enemy. Be careful, folks. Don't ever play with the enemy. We know Satan is our enemy and Satan has many influences in our life. Let me just encourage you, don't ever play with the enemy. I said this the other night in my Wednesday night class and I'm going to say it to you as a congregation. Folks, the longer I'm in ministry, the more I understand that we are in a war. It is a spiritual warfare that we're in and it's serious. We look around at all the things that are happening, and I'm going to tell you, and I, God knows, and I'm not going to tell but I look at things that are happening physically in people's life, emotionally. I, I, see what, I see what's happening in marriages and homes, and I want you to understand, you can, you, you can attribute it to anything you want to, the rise of mental disease in our country, all the, the terrible things that just happened in our community over the last two days. I want you to understand, folks, this is a spiritual battle that we're in. Please do not play with the enemy. You better take this serious. He's in... Listen. That's a whole other message. I want you to understand. Samson got very comfortable with the enemy. On one hand, he is born as a hero. But he will be buried as a hero as well. But in between, he becomes a bandit, a trickster, and one who carelessly wastes his extraordinary gifts and callings in his life. Folks, I want you to understand, that's where a lot of us find ourselves today. We have been born into privilege. You understand that. We, we're here this morning, we hear the Gospel of Jesus Christ we sit in a comfortable building. We feel protected. Most of us, we feel warm. We've been fed. Listen to me. We have spiritual blessings on top of spiritual blessings. Samson is typical of many Christians. And what we have done is we have become comfortable with the enemy. The vows we were taking as children, the things that we promised when we became adults, all of those things because of the blessings of God that He's placed on our life. Listen to me. We grew up in Christian homes. We've been afforded the opportunities to hear the Gospel, to serve in the Kingdom of God, but we've allowed something or someone to get involved or pull us away from this relationship with Jesus Christ. Something has brought us away from those vows, from those promises that we gave God on the day that we accepted Him as our Savior and that we committed to Him. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning, but have you ever made the statement to God, if you get me through this, then I will fill in the blank. You ever made that statement? Somehow or another, we, we, we forget those vows. We forget those promises. Let me remind you of something God hadn't forgotten. <laughs> those vows that we made to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, to serve Him as our Lord and Savior of our life, I want to remind you, God has not forgotten that vow you made that day when you knelt at that altar. He still remembers that. 
And He's willing and He's ready to bless you and encourage you and provide for you all the things that you need in your life. But He's saying this morning, listen to me, don't play with the enemy. Don't forget your vows. That's Samson. He was blessed. He was privileged. He abused every one of them. But then there's Delilah. Delilah. If you notice in Samson's life, he had many other women in his life. But this is the first one that is named in any relationship. Her Arabic name, which is an interesting term, and I think, <laughs> let me just, I'll leave it at that. But her name in the Arabic actually means to flirt. Did you know that? Or, of the night. That's the two different terminologies that are given there. Now you notice very early on, and I read to you the text out of Judges chapter 16, that Samson, a Hebrew man, falls in love with a Philistine woman. Bottom line, that's wrong. That was against the very law of God. They were not supposed to marry outside of the Hebrew family. So he knew right off the bat, this was wrong, this is not something I do. Just because of who she was. And then it violated his Nazarite vow as well. He was not supposed to be engaging in this type of relationship because he was a Nazarite and he had taken that vow to serve God. So on one level, there again, his, fam his Israelites. Number two, his Nazarite vow that he had made. And number three, if you read in the text, his family was against this as well. So I got three strikes, right? <laughs> Does that make any sense? One, wrong culture. Number two, mm, broke my vow to God. Number three, family's not happy. So on three different levels, this should not have happened. Go back and read through the text. Delilah is not in love with Samson. Although she will test him with the phrase, Do you love me? Why would she do that? Listen to me. Delilah is loyal to the Philistines, to their causes and to their plans. She does not love Samson. Listen to me, folks. Woohoo! Look, Satan does not love you. The enemy does not love you. But you know what? He'll test you with that phrase, Do you love me? Do you love the things that I can provide? Do you love the things that are out there in this world that I control? Do you love those things? Listen to me. The enemy is going to be faithful to his causes, to his plans. He wants to see them accomplished. Delilah did not love Samson. She loved the Philistines and what they were trying to accomplish. She was faithful to her cause. Samson was not. You see, Delilah's appeal, look at it in the text, was not to the intellect of Samson, not to his faith, or even to reason, but it was to one thing, his flesh. I think also Samson becomes so infatuated with his own talents that he forgets God had given him the talents and abilities. So Delilah begins to deceive him. And it reaches the pinnacle in the fourth attempt, you remember what happens, to find Samson's secret, which we know was the length of his hair. She reverts to blackmail and claims his love for her cannot be genuine if he is not fully committed to her. Hmm. Look, listen to me. Sin will always take you further than you're willing to go. It will cost you more than you're willing to pay. Walking down the path. Listen to me. Satan will not stop. Deception didn't work, so guess what? Let's take it a step further. Satan's not going to give up on a, his attacks on you. They're going to intensify. They're going to get worse. Basically what's happening here is Delilah is asking Samson to put his love for her above his love for God. A commitment to her must take precedent over a commitment to God. 
She says, Samson, place our love. Samson, place our love above your love for God. Because if you love me, you'll tell me your secrets. Folks, I want you to understand something this morning. That's what the world is crying out to us this morning. To place the love of this world above the love for God. Brother Mark, how is it doing that? How, I, don't, I don't love this world. I'm thankful if you don't. But let me remind you just this morning of a few Delilahs that are in our life. Because <laughs> listen to me, all of us have a Delilah. All of us. You say, Brother Mark, I don't know anybody named Delilah. <laughs> the principal. There's something there trying to influence us to tell us that we need to love it more than we love God. There's something out there doing that. I don't know what it is in your life, but let me give you some suggestions here or some reasons for just a moment. The first one, let me just say at the core, maybe all of it, is what I call indwelling sin. The term sin is sometimes used by the Apostle Paul, and if you have time, I encourage you to turn with me to Romans chapter 6, especially chapter 7. Sin is used by the Apostle Paul sometimes as a force or an energy within the heart of man that seeks to rule or control him. Let me just share with you, and I, I don't have time to read chapter 6 and 7 together, but let me lead, read the conclusion of chapter 7. When he talks about this danger of sin. Now, since Samson knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing was wrong. There again, this comfortability that he had with, with the enemy. He knew, there, he knew he shouldn't break those vows. He knew he shouldn't do those things. But read with me Romans chapter 7. Begin with me in verse 18. Here's what Paul said. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Did you know that? For to will us present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I, I want to do what's good, but I don't. The, this flesh drives me to do what is wrong, what is sin. For the good that I would, would I do not, but the evil which I would not, I do. He said, I always find myself doing the wrong thing. You ever been there? This body, this flesh, this desires control me. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I do good, Evil is present within me. So the law taught me, listen to me, that sometimes even when I do good, I still break the law. I still oppose the things of God. Verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, my flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Look at the answer. Look, the answer's there. How can I defeat this flesh, this indwelling sin that's in me? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, with the flesh the law of sin. He said, listen, I can have victory. Look at me, let me give you a revelation. You do not have to live in sin. Dear Christian, look at me. You do not have to live in sin. It is a choice you make to sin against God. You know the law. You know the truth. You know what God has blessed you with. You know the question is, will you choose not to sin? That's why we're called free will Baptists. We believe we have that free will to choose. You don't have to sin. You don't have to oppose God. You don't have to live in sin. You can accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and be forgiven of your sin. And you can, through the work of the Holy Spirit working in you, through the Word of God, your worship of God, and your walk with God, you can be a victorious Christian. Read, look at the verse right after 7. Chapter 7. Look at verse 8, chapter 1. Look what it said. Now therefore there is no condemnation to them that are what? In Christ Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? You can have victory. You can live the Christian life. Samson had every opportunity. He chose this path. Now I'm going to make a statement here, and some of you, you may want to talk to me after this. But if the truth 
the Holy Spirit of God is not controlling your life, listen to me, sin is. There's no middle ground. Well, Brother Mark, I, I'm... I, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. You, can, you can't live here and live there. You, you understand that. You can't ride the fence. We've we got too many problems riding the fence. Everybody should know that by now. Just look in the... Well, okay. You understand you cannot ride the fence. Either sin is controlling your life or the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Word of God is. There is no in-between. We in churches today, we've, we've sold that bill to people that listen to me. God understands you're okay with God. Just live. Ooh, no, 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 no. You're not all right. God is not all right. He wants you to change your life. You do. There, it, there is no. God does not condone sin. So if there's indwelling sin in our life, I want you to understand, you're being sold to Delilah. Listen, you're okay. That's your Delilah. Now I'm going to get in trouble right here, but I'm going I'm to go ahead and say this. I've thought about not saying it, but I've got to say it. There are a lot of people today that are looking for a truth to match their lifestyle instead of changing their lifestyle to meet truth. Listen to me. I'm just going to step out here and say it. They'll search until they find a church that is preaching the truth they want to hear so they don't have to change their life instead of going somewhere where they're going to hear the truth that demands their life changes. You search around long enough, guess what? You'll find somebody that tickles your fancy. Paul said they tickle your ears. That's what he said. Did you know that? So you'll keep looking to what? You find the truth that you want to hear because it matches how you want to live your life. Folks, listen to me. That is indwelling sin. God does not condone that. The standard has not changed. Second problem. I'll just keep going. The intense desires of the flesh, or we call lust. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The Apostle Paul refers to the sinful inclination that tempts us in ways to handle life. Our, how to find happiness. Uh, how to find significance. How to find security in our life. He said there's a temptation there to find those things in our own resources and apart from God. That is the desires of the flesh that Paul describes in Ephesians 2. Especially verses 1 through 3. So what is he saying here? He's saying here, listen, the desires are not wrong. In fact, if you read that text in Philippians 2, 1-3, through Paul gives a very graphic picture of the unregenerate condition of man under the condition or the domination of, of the flesh. Being dead in sin without God, man is ruled by the desires or the cravings of the flesh. So when we allow relationships, codependency, other things to define and control our lives, that always leads to what? Abusive relationships, both emotionally and physically. So what is he saying here? He said God has created these desires within us. They are there. But how we fulfill them, however that is, using the resources of our own, can be wrong. Um, God said... I created them male and female. You understand that? And he said there should be a relationship between those two. There is a desire created within the human heart to have that relationship, to have that intimacy between two people. That is not wrong. That is God-given. Read Genesis chapter 3, 4. It's there. There is that created desire that God has put within us. In fact, Paul says, go back into the book of Ephesians, he said, husbands, love your wives. There is that, that desire is there. It should be fulfilled through the marriage relationship. The problem is that our culture, we have redefined how to fulfill that desire. Through cohabitation, living outside the bonds of marriage. Same-sex marriage. We, we can go on to define how we've done that. Folks, I want you to understand, 
God gave us those things, but Paul said when we use our own resources instead of the path that God has provided to fulfill those resources, we have sinned. That's our Delilah. Doesn't God want me to be happy? Yes. Doesn't God want me to be loved? Yes. But I want you to understand, this is going to sound crazy, our relationship with Jesus Christ and the truth of the Word of God must drive every relationship that we have. In fact, you know what Christ said? Love me. Hate your parents. Ugh. Why? What was He trying to tell you there? He said, listen, your love for me has got to drive every relationship, even the parental relationship, even the marriage relationship, even friendships. I read this article the other day. And I'm going to be... Well, I'll save that for later. You say, Brother Mark, what Christ is asking is, sounds pretty selfish. Folks, I want you to understand, it's not based on selfishness, it's based on love. God wants us to have the best possible life that we can. He wants to have a, us to have abundant, everlasting life, and He knows that's only going to come through relationship with Him. And fulfilling that relationship first will drive all other relationships. It's not selfishness. It's for our own best interest. Let me hasten on. Let me say this. There's some of you that are probably sitting here this morning, and you're looking at me and saying, Brother Mark, that's pretty narrow. <laughs> Listen to me, look at me for a minute. Truth is always narrow. It's always defined. When you have a court of law, I want you to understand, there's one person's story, the other person's story, and then there's the truth. Is that right, Brother Phil? <laughs> okay. I, I want you to keep that in mind. And, and what we have is, here's the truth, there's the truth, but I want you to understand, the Word of God, that's the truth. And it is very narrow. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It is narrow, but it is the truth. Let me hasten on. The problem with worldly desires. In, in Titus chapter 2, verse 12, Paul talked about these worldly desires that control us. Desires mean a passionate longing. Um, it is in the context that determines the nature of that desire which makes it wrong. He said, so he qualified, desires are not wrong, but worldly desires are wrong. Worldly is an interesting term in Scripture. It has to do with pertaining to or deriving its standards and values or motivations from the world. This is a clear reference to an organized system in the world and how it operates under the deception, I think, of both uh, and power and control of Satan and everyone that opposes God, His kingdom, His value, and His purposes as well. Folks, listen to me. And I said it earlier in this message. We are in a war. Listen to me. It is a well-organized, structured army enemy that we're facing. Satan doesn't just do things by chance. You understand, there's a structure that's there. He knows. It's organized. He is, he is powerful. But I'm thankful this morning that greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. So these things that oppose, and you can read through the newspaper or whatever you want to understand, but anything that opposes the value system of God, the truth in the Word of God, I want, I'm, here I'm getting narrow again, but anything that opposes the value system of God is sin, it is of Satan. Sorry. If it's not of God, it has to be of Satan. There is no middle ground. So if there's something out there that goes against the value systems or the truth of the Word of God, or how we make decisions, or what motivates us to live our life, I want you to understand, if it's not of God, it is of this world, which means it is of Satan himself. Now, Go back to that text in Titus chapter 2 because it also it is compared with 
the activated or controlled part of the Holy Spirit as well that seeks to guide and control our life as well. So the Holy Spirit of God is there directing or motivating in us our life and it opposes, the Holy Spirit opposes the work of Satan. There are two value systems at war today. Not, listen to me, not just in this world, but in your life. Don't, don't just put this in the world. Put it personal. Satan is after you, and he is throwing everything that he can at you to say this world and its value system, what it values, what it says is important, what it says is how you should live your life, that value system Satan is throwing at you every way that he can. Let me show you one of the ways that he's doing it. You see, when you begin to make decisions based on financial, watch out. When you begin to make decisions based on acceptability, will my friends like me if I do this? When you begin to make decisions solely financially, solely acceptability, or solely because it's popular, be careful, that is the core of this world's value system. Oh, I'm in trouble, so let me just get there. Popularity drives the culture we live in. Don't pull out your phones. But dare say, many of you either tweeted, posted, or something on social media sometime within the last 48 hours. And what you did, you went back and checked how many times it was liked. Pull up YouTube. How many views has it had? How many friends do you have? Oh, let's just get personal. How many people said, boy, you dress nice today? Popularity is driving our culture. If it's popular, it's got to be right. Because everybody likes it. Making decisions based on popularity, listen to me, is illogical. Why? Because truth does not change. Basing decisions based on popularity is fleeting because, listen, what is popular today will not be tomorrow. And understand... Making decisions based on popularity usually violates biblical truth. Folks, did you know something? We're supposed to be the radical cause in this, in this world today. Let me hasten on. What we have seen now in this last Delilah is the distortion of passion, pleasure, and pride. Read 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. The Apostle John describes and divided these internal forces into three powerful energies of the inner man. The lust of the flesh, passion. The intense desire, the lust of the eyes, pleasure, and the boastful pride, arrogance of life. Now the problem is, listen to me, there's not a problem, there, and this culture has done this to us, there's not a problem with the presence of passion. Listen to me, you need to love God passionately. You need to worship God with passion. Paul tells us, there again, once again, to love your wife, men, passionately, is what he says. So the, the term passion or, or this presence of passion in our life is not wrong. The, there again, the presence of pleasure is not wrong. Enjoying the time that we have in the blessings of God in this life, the creation that He's given us, the relationships that He's put in our life. Listen to me, that is not wrong to enjoy life. Even pride. And the things that God has blessed us with, that's not wrong. But when we misuse their function and we abuse those things within the human heart, they become sin. How does that happen? That's when we begin to make decisions based only on emotions. What feels right, must be right. So Brother Mark, how, how do we correct these things? Let me get you to that point this morning. 
the answer to the Delilahs. How do you answer them? Let me give you a few things. Number one, I want you to remember this. Look at me. Satan hates you. Let me say it again. Satan hates you. He does not want what's good for you. Oh, listen to me. He, there's pleasures out there and there's things that are out there. He's, listen to me. Sin is sweet for a season is what Paul, uh, David said in the Psalms. But listen to me. Its end is utter destruction. Satan wants to destroy your life, your home, your marriage, this church, this culture. Satan hates you. Don't ever think anything in this world is out there for your good. I want you to understand, its value system, its desires, its distortions, all of those things are there for your detriment. He's trying to destroy you. Let me give you a second thing. See the end from the beginning. If Samson could have realized where his life was leading, he probably would have made different decisions. So let me encourage you to do this. One, hunger and thirst after righteousness. Love the eternal, not the temporal. Billy Sunday, one of the greatest evangelists that probably ever lived. Here's what he said one day. He said, one reason sin flourishes in our culture is because we treat sin like a cream puff and not a rattlesnake. Samson got comfortable with the enemy. And it cost him. It started with a group of people. Then it got down to one person, Delilah, that led him to violate his vow with God, to violate his very conscience, his truth that was in his life, everything that his parents had instilled in him, and brought him to the place where he utterly destroyed his own life. Why? Samson forgot to hunger and thirst after righteousness, not this world. Samson began to love the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, the pride of this world, the passions of this world, instead of the things of heaven. And it cost him. So my question to you this morning is, what is the Delilah in your life? What's pulling you away from God instead of pushing you to God? Look at me. I've said this before from this pulpit, and I will say it again. Anything that is not pushing you toward God and is pulling you away, you don't need it in your life. That's your Delilah. How do you deal with that? You confess it. Go back to God. Hunger and thirst after Him and righteousness. Love Him supremely above all people, all things. Christ Himself said what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Love it first, then all these things will be added to you. Is that where you're living today? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for this day. Lord, we thank You this morning that Jesus never fails. <laughs> that when we surrender our life to You, it is not only just eternal life, but it's abundant life in Jesus Christ. But Lord, this world that we're living in is so easy for us to get pulled away. To allow the passions of this life, the, the, the pride of this life, to pull us away from You and forget the things that we promised. Forget all the blessings that You poured out on us. And to surrender our life to a, to a world that, <laughs> that doesn't even care about us that's going to leave us empty, lonesome all by ourselves, and in the end, hating ourselves. God, help us to love You supremely. And to base our decisions on the truth of the Word of God and our relationship with Jesus Christ and not any other thing or any other person. 
Lord, we need you today. I'm going to ask you to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed. Holy Spirit, speak into your heart. There's some things you need to change. You need to put Jesus at the center. The very center of your life today. Nothing else matters. Check Jesus at the center of it Lord, all. Lord, be the center of my life. Jesus That's at your prayer. the I center you to come. of it Just all. Just kneel here and ask Him. Invite Him into your life. From beginning to the end. It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Put him at the center of your home, Jesus. your marriage. Is that Jesus where he's at? Jesus at the center of it Nothing all. Nothing else matters. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. Maybe this morning you'd like to come and pray. There's some gather here at the altar just to encourage them. I know it's a big step to walk down here to kneel in an altar. It's hard. You know what the world's telling you? Ah, you don't need to do that. That's, <laughs> that's pride kicking in. Don't do it. Don't surrender to that. Don't make your decision this morning based upon what your friend would think. <laughs> Don't make your decision this morning based upon what your spouse would think. Your neighbor. Whoever's sitting with you. Listen to me. Make your decision based upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. What does God want you to do today? We're going to sing one more verse of that chorus. Won't you come as we sing? Jesus at the center of my life. Jesus at the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing, else matters. nothing in this world nothing will Nothing in do. this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. Our Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, we do pray today that you will be at the center of our lives, the center of our homes, the center of our church. Lord, that all that we do will be focused and centered on pleasing you, honoring you, following you with every decision that we make in this life. Lord, encourage us. We need you today. Lord, as we place You at the center, nothing else matters. You are at the center. Everything we decide, everything we love, everything we do is going to be focused and centered on You. God, help us. We need You today. We need You. Lord, the temptations are great. The powers of this world are strong. But Lord, we thank You today that You are greater you are greater. And we rest in that fact this morning. And it's in your precious name that we pray. All God's people said, Amen.